The financial sector, Silicon Valley and Big Pharma are lauded as great wealth creators. But according to economist Mariana Matsukato, they are often just shuffling around existing value or even worse, destroying it. She makes that argument in her new book, The Value of Everything, Making and Taking in the Global Economy. Mariana Matsukato is professor of the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at University College London, and she joins us now on the line from New York, New York. Uh, Senora, dottore, professore, so good to have <laughs> you back on our airwaves again. How are you doing? I'm very fine. I'm very happy to be talking to you again, Steve. Excellent. Well, the last time we talked to you, of course, was about your previous book, The Entrepreneurial State. Uh, no, that is not an oxymoron for those who want to tell that joke. How does your new book pick up from where the last book left off? So the last book, The Entrepreneurial State, actually had quite a bit of impact. There was policy leaders all over the world that seemed to actually be quite thirsty for that new narrative about the state doing more than just fixing market failures or, you know, making roads and bridges and infrastructure. Because in the book, I actually talked about the state as an investor of first resort that had been required for the IT revolution, the nanotech revolution, and of course will be required for what hopefully will become the green revolution. But what struck me was that even those who sort of caught on to that message, you know, again, this new kind of not just narrative, but theory, which can also guide policymakers on how to actually structure state institutions so they're able to take that uh, investment, strategic investment role, the details of the actual, the actual policies that they implemented, for example, different types of tax credits, continued to be quite problematic. And that was because they continued to be fed different stories, uh, different requests by different parts of the economy, different actors in the economy, that by presenting themselves as wealth creators and value creators, then were actually able to negotiate, and I would argue con, the government into implementing policies that really just increased inequality and were actually bad for innovation. And so I wanted to take a step back and instead of talking about these you know, exciting things around innovation, just talk about value. Why do we actually accept so much uh, these stories, which are really just stories about who the value creators are? I was actually quite struck, I must say, with the Labour Party in the UK when they lost the 2015 election. The self-analysis the next day by some leaders of the Labour Party was, oh, we lost because we didn't embrace the wealth creators. And I thought to myself, if a labor party is using the word wealth creation to mean just business, we've got a problem. Because of course business creates value. We know that. That's why we have business schools teaching them all sorts of great things mm. around the world. But labor creates value. State institutions create value. Charities increasingly create value in different areas like uh, health and also renewable energy. And so if we don't have an understanding of this collective value creation process, we have a problem. And I'll stop in a minute, otherwise I'll, this will be a monologue. But uh, <laughs> Plato, Plato, smart guy, once said that storytellers rule the world. And for me, what the book was about was to really allow people to rethink the stories that are being told about value creation, because otherwise the 1%, 99% dynamic, which mm -hmm. is in fact, you know, signals who's ruling the world, will continue. It'll be very hard to change that. Well, and as you point out in the book, one of the greatest undervalued things in the history of the world is uh, housework, which apparently the economy doesn't put any value on it on, but we know that, you know, life as we know it would shut down uh, if people who do the housework in this world just stopped doing it. Let me read an excerpt from the book, actually, as we try to uh, reconsider value. Uh, Sheldon, put this graphic up if you would. The way the word value is used in modern economics has made it easier for value-extracting activities to masquerade as value-creating activities. And in the process, rents, unearned incomes, get confused with profits, earned income. Inequality rises, and investment in the real economy falls. If the goal is to produce growth that is more innovation-led, smart growth, more inclusive and more sustainable, we need a better understanding of value to steer us. Okay, in which case, start steering us in that direction. How do you want us to rethink this notion of value? Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the care work before. So if, um, if you marry your cleaner, GDP will go down because that was actually a job that was being paid for. And now perhaps by marrying the cleaner, whether it's a man or a woman, let's, you know, let's make it gender neutral, um, that work might still be done, but it's not paid for. So already there, one should start thinking, oh, God, wait, we have this measure which, you know, makes GDP go down just because you marry someone. Or um, when we pollute, GDP actually goes up because we have to pay for that pollution. So the real issue here is prices. We are only valuing activities that have prices. Now, um, 
this actually has to do with economic thought because the history of economic thought wasn't always like that. So you had the classical economists who were Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Karl Marx. They actually had a theory of value which was very much tied to how production was organized. I don't know if you read The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith, but too he big. really- Too big, too big, couldn't get through it. Oh yeah? <laughs> ah. That's for you <laughs> to still, read and tell me about rather hope. than me to read. There's still hope, okay. <laughs> I'll read it to you if you want. Okay. <laughs> anyway, he focused a lot on the division of labor. So there was this famous example of the pin factory and how increasing the division of labor, increased productivity, growth, et cetera. Um, they put emphasis really on industrial labor as being the core of value. And this was, of course, the time of the Industrial Revolution, so it's not very uh, surprising. But they you know, also worried about things like mechanization, how to structure production in particular ways that would increase growth. So they actually had a theory of value which ultimately transmitted also into a theory of price. Similarly, with the physiocrats before them in the 1700s during the agricultural, well, when society was still fundamentally an agricultural society, they, and these were mainly French uh, men, uh, Canet and Turgot, uh, they really did the first spreadsheet ever called um, the Tableau Economique. Uh, they were very concerned that farm labor, which is what they thought you know, produced value, would be structured in particular ways to increase the revenue and the, you know, uh, the uh, produce that was being produced, and also that then the profits earned from that would be replugged back into uh, improvements in farm labor as, as opposed to being siphoned off, so extracted, for just fighting wars or for dressing the king and the queen. Um, and so what's interesting about both of these, the physiocrats and the classical economists, so again, the ones that came before neoclassical economics, which is the current body of thought being taught, is they really had, again, an objective theory of value tied to how they understood uh, production to be fundamental. And don't think of it as something static. You know, technological change is constantly uh, moving about. And so also an analysis of technological change. What then happened was that the current body of thought that we're teaching around the world in these classes called Econ 101, they don't even call it a theory of value because there's only one. We don't teach alternative theories of value to our students anymore. Um, the the um, the, how do you say, causation went the other way. It was a theory of price that determined value, so preferences. So workers' wages were tied to their preferences for leisure versus work, as opposed to some objective conditions, say, around the class struggle. And so what that means is that as long as you're earning quite a bit and can justify that by the price of the outputs, right, which include labor, um, then you must actually be quite productive. You're valuable. And this is why after the crisis in 2009, one year after Lehman Brothers uh, exploded, uh, you had Lloyd Blankfein, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, with a straight face, but he was not telling a joke, he mm. said Goldman Sachs workers are the most productive in the world. Because in fact, it becomes this tautology that if, if we measure production, if we measure output, by goods that have prices, then obviously the price of the labor of Goldman Sachs is very high, and that reveals the value. Well, his uh, workers do create a lot of market. His workers do create an awful lot of wealth, do they not? Yes, but the question is, what are they doing? And this comes back to your earlier point. And again, in the classicals, it was interesting. They talked about rent, um, not as the current way that economists talk about it, which is a deviation from a competitive price, which can be competed away to get rid of monopoly power. They talked about unearned income. In fact, Adam Smith was much more forceful. He said, rent is theft, it's robbery, mm. right? So if you think of the modern financial sector, there's all these different types of intermediating activities which are charging different types of fees, but also different ways in which those incomes are generated, including also, I'm not just talking about the financial sector, but the real economy, so real industry, which I would argue has become increasingly financialized, and we can come back to that in a minute, mm -hmm. where share prices are the ways that uh, you know, firms are judging their value, um, then we just get a very difficult situation. A perfect example of this happened, where the CEO of a large pharmaceutical company called Nostrum uh, increased the price overnight of an antibiotic, which is an essential medicine, by 400 percent, and said that this, you know, that he had a moral imperative to increase that price of the antibiotic by 400 percent in order to satisfy his shareholders. So this comes back to where do we understand value to be created? So it's not that his company or that his workers were not creating value. I'm sure they are. And, you know, as with many companies, of course, they're creating value. But there's this extreme um, disjointed situation where the returns that are being earned, both in the financial sector, but also in these kinds of companies, for example, and not only in the pharmaceutical industry, are completely disproportionate compared to what they're actually doing. So 
if you look at most medicines, and this is surely true of most antibiotics, but also of something like 75% of new molecular entities with priority rating, these are the important new drugs that are coming out versus the Me Too drugs, they trace something like 75% of their research to uh, nationally funded uh, high-risk early stage research, for example, in the U.S. Uh, to the National Institutes of Health. And this, again, is something that I told quite in detail in my, in my previous book. But so if, you, if we don't understand value as collectively created, and we believe in things like shareholder value without really questioning what is the underlying uh, proposition and assumptions that that particular type of behavior is, uh, is built upon, if we don't debunk those assumptions and really reveal that they're just myths and they're stories, it's very hard then to change things. And I would argue we haven't changed things after the financial crisis. We still have an incredibly short-term and speculative financial sector. We have record-level hoarding in the business sector. We have record-level financialization, so $3 trillion having been spent just on share buybacks in the Fortune 500 companies in the last 10 years to boost share prices, stock options, and executive pay. That comes back to the issue around inequality. These are things that are very hard to change just by saying, oh, it's unfair, oh, you should be more long-termist. They're built upon fundamental assumptions and stories and theories about value, which are problematic. So let and me ask the question could, then. Oh, sorry. No, yeah. oh, well, I, I, I just want to understand then how, you, how we're going to get from A to B here, which is to say, mm. since you've made the case that, that public dollars have actually underwritten so much of the private wealth that has been generated by the example you give of the antibiotics that are now uh, so much more expensive, how does the public, how does the average citizen uh, realize his or her windfall for the investment that he or she has made in all of this? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting you, you put it that way, because that's exactly why I've also uh, done something that makes me very proud, but it's also quite tiring, which is to set up a whole institute and department around this question, because I actually believe civil servants have to be trained differently. They have to be thinking about themselves in a different way, and then also structure the contracts they have with these public-private partnerships in different ways in order to get back a public return. And I call that public value. Um, and the institute that I set up is called Innovation and Public Purpose. It's actually a department. So we'll have a whole MPA to train uh, people to start mm. just, e you know, even asking these questions. And so there's different ways in which public value can be achieved in those relationships, which is not happening right now. First of all, that word that I just used, public value, believe it or not, doesn't exist in economics. And that's not surprising because, again, value is assumed to only occur in companies, value creation. All right, at so police, the, nurses, firefighters, all of that value is not recognized no, at all. No, they are, they are important in the economy. Their, um, their uh, salaries are included in GDP as a cost, but the value they're actually creating, because it's often free, you don't pay for the police. You don't pay for the nurse, at least in, in countries that are civilized and have a public <laughs> health care system. Anyway, that's another conversation. Um, <laughs> um, then it's also very hard to measure the productivity also and, and the usefulness and the value of government activities because we only look at the costs in GDP, mm -hmm. whereas with uh, you know, the private sector, we also have the actual output that they sell. But um, without getting too complicated on that, the point is that this term public value you know, it's really hard to talk about it, actually, in economics when it's assumed that value occurs inside business. And what the state does is just kind of do the background things which facilitate or enable value to be created in business. And there's a technical word for that. You're fixing market failure. So funding things that the private sector won't fund. You're filling a gap. It's always like this mending, fixing, filling the gap kind of exercise. Already with the words, even my facial expression, you can probably tell, it's kind of boring to talk about it that way. And so what then happens is also the confidence of the people working in government also gets reduced. At worst, it creates hemorrhaging. Taught people want to leave government when they're not seen as value creators. And they're always either called you know, an impediment to growth or at best de-risking the cool guys in business. Um, and so literally the contracts we set up become problematic. And the example I always give because it's so stark is uh, the case of Tesla. You know, Elon Musk is often in the news. He has these three companies, Solar City. SpaceX and Tesla. First of all, he got $5 billion from the U.S. government, from Uncle Sam. And I often say, he never said thank you. I am a mother of four kids. I always tell him to say thank you. So that's, that's the first problem. He never said thank you. So people don't know, because if he said thank you out loud, then actually that would become part of the public discourse. No one knows that. So just with Tesla, example, he got from the Department of Energy a $465 million guaranteed loan 
Um, and the same kind of portfolio of investments, and this was during the period in which Obama was really trying to steer the economy in a greener direction, included investing in Solyndra, which was a company that most people in the U.S. also know about, but not because it was successful. No, it failed. But because it was a massive failure, yeah. and the taxpayer had to pick up the bill. Got bailed out, right? Because it's a guaranteed loan. It's guaranteed by who? Mm -hmm. Taxpayer. So $500 million. Now, what Obama did, and it's just quite striking, because he actually had Goldman Sachs guys in government, as we know, that, that becomes a continued problem, <laughs> the presence of, uh, uh, you know, those kind of interests in government. Anyway, they should have said to him something different. Instead, what he said was, if you don't pay back the loan to Tesla, we get 3 million shares in your company. The price per share went from 9 to 90. So had he said, uh, sorry, when they took out the loan, 2009, it was 9, 2013, it was 90. So why would you want 3 million shares in a crappy company that doesn't pay back the loan? It doesn't make any sense. Had he said, we'll take out 3 million shares if you are successful and pay back the loan, which makes sense, right, because the government's taking risk. Mm -hmm. For each Tesla, you will have inevitably three, four, or five cylindras. Any venture capitalist will tell you that. Had he actually taken out those shares with the success, he would have had more than enough, given the difference in share price, to pay back the cylindra loss and the next round of investments. So why didn't he? because you only start thinking this way and ask those kind of questions if you see yourself as an investor, if you see yourself as a co-creator of wealth alongside business. This is not state versus business. And this is always about collaborations. We need public-private partnerships as much as, you know, in the green economy as we had in the IT revolution. Uh, it's, it's very important to collaborate, but it's very hard to collaborate if one side is always kind of seen as the kind of boring de-risker and the other side gets to be all kind of, you know, dynamic and, and interesting, not just because that creates a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of where people want to work, but also, again, the contracts. And, you know, what I do in the book, the new book on value, is I really bring these questions down to the fundamental assumptions in these conversations, again, about where value comes from. So, you know, if, if, if we do want a strategic, active investor within the public sector to do in the green revolution what we had in IT, where everything in our iPhone is publicly funded, right? Uh, internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri. That's the story I don't tire of telling. <laughs> if we want that, big if, because if we don't want it, then nothing. Then we won't have much technological change, history tells us. If we want that, we really need to start asking, how do we socialize not only the risks, but also the rewards? But, you know, in finance, you know, we really haven't reformed the system. Again, the, we have a 10-year anniversary. Everyone is not so much celebrating, but talking about this week from, uh, about the crisis. We still have speculative short-term finance. We still have, again, industry not reinvesting its profits. So the profit wage ratio is at record levels. Uh, so there's no profits problem. <laughs> there's an, a reinvestment problem. We have private debt to disposable income back at the level it was just before the crisis. And by the way, that's what caused the crisis. All this talk about public debt and austerity was kind of this, uh, you know, distraction. What caused the crisis was private debt. And we had then the public sector come in and save the day, bail out the banks and produce a bit of fiscal stimulus. But then very quickly that turned into different forms of austerity, which then really made growth limp, but also didn't have enough bold policies that really could have steered the system in such a way that we worry just as much about the direction of growth as of the rate of growth. But what I try to do in the book, again, is, is say, you know, these policies that basically weren't there or that have failed, in order for us to really also take advantage of this 10-year anniversary and to change things for real, why not bring it back down to first principles and see how both in the pharmaceutical industry, in finance, in the Uber economy, the whole data economy, we currently have a very problematic situation where, you know, value extraction activities or passing for value creation activities or the simply the rewards being earned by particular actors are completely disproportionate to what actually happened in that sector in terms of looking at all the other collective actors who were important. Well, let me jump and in on that because... the digital economy is very interesting. Sure. Let me, let me jump in on that, though, because if usually it takes a crisis to focus our attention or get us to think differently about something. And as you point out, that crisis happened 10 years ago already and does not seem to have prompted a rethink about so many of the themes that you raise in your book. If that crisis, the worst financial crisis in any of our lifetimes, didn't get it done and we're 10 years after the fact, and still you seem to be a fairly lonely voice out there trying to get us to reevaluate these ideas, what's it going to take? 
Well, maybe this populist uh, problem that we see around the world. This is, you know, if we have another crisis, it's going to be much more scary this time. Uh, think of the governments that were in power back then. You know, they weren't perfect, but, you know, they were much more mild <laughs> across the world than what we see today. Just think of the, uh, you know, basically semi-fascist party in power right now in Italy, where, you know, all the blame goes to the immigrants and, you know, walls are being built there as well, like uh, Trump's walls here with Mexico. Um, and all over, again, all over Europe, we're seeing right-wing, very conservative governments uh, popping up. If a crisis occurs now, the way that that crisis will be um, understood and digested, I think, will be much more dangerous in terms of fueling even more fear. Fear is probably the worst reaction you can have, um, you know, in, in terms of not also coming to your senses and trying to think more wholeheartedly about different factors that might be surrounding you. This is just as true in politics as in someone's uh, personal life. So, you know, if the fear factor becomes the uh, tool that is used to interpret the crisis, we're going to see these populist uh, uh, governments, but also just movements, I think, go completely out of the roof. And that's why we have to be extremely careful and really treat this as a political slash economic problem. But that fear, it's, you know, I can understand where it's coming from. I just mentioned private debt to disposable income, income is back at record levels. Why? Because people have to take out credit just to retain their existing living standards because real wages haven't gone up. So they should fear. Of course, people are insecure about the future. Um, you know, costs are rising. University tuitions are rising. We didn't have university tuitions in the UK, and all of a sudden we do, and yet people's wages haven't increased to, you know, keep up with that kind of uh, increase. But also, you know, the student loan crisis in the US makes Lehman Brothers look like Toy Story um, <laughs> when that explodes yeah. in the trillions. Um, and so it's, we shouldn't be condescending. It's not that people are foolishly fearing things. It's just that we haven't had really the right kind of, uh, I don't want to say narrative because it sounds like it really is just storytelling, but we haven't had, I would say, leadership um, in terms of the economy. And this, you know, I'm talking as an economist, so mm -hmm. not as a philosopher, that also, first of all, allows people to understand what's happening around them. So let me just give you an example. Most people confuse the deficit with the debt. Right. So Italy, for example, has had a pretty low deficit historically, but a very high debt to GDP. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that? Because debt to GDP is a ratio and the bottom GDP, if you're not investing in anything that increases it, so different areas that increase productivity, then the denominator won't increase. So the ratio can, in theory, go to infinity. And yet what do we have in Europe? An obsession about the deficit. No one is allowed to have anything above three. And ideally, it'll be zero. Now, if you're not investing in those areas that create long-term growth, guess what? Your, your debt to GDP will rise. And it's impossible to have a euro in Europe with the really skewed level of competitiveness we currently see between the North and the South in Europe. And yet the kind of policies we've implemented, again, after the crisis were not those that would bring competitiveness to be more symmetric, because that would have required all sorts of investments, including in the public sector, in Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain that were not allowed to be had because the attention went to the wrong area. So and just again, then, all right, yeah. then in, in our last couple of minutes then, just, t just who's the political leader? Who is the respected international leader that you would like to see walk into their office one day with your book under their arm, suggesting that they are going to lead a rethink of all of these issues? I don't want to, so you want a name? A name would be great. <laughs> Well, I must say, I mean, let me just mention some countries. Now, forget the individuals running the countries or not. But, you know, Denmark is a country. It's tiny. It's a tiny little country. So people often accuse me of talking about, you know, big countries that have resources that smaller countries don't. But Denmark today is the number one provider of high-tech green services to China's green economy. And China is spending $1.7 trillion to launch its green economy. It's learning all the right lessons from Silicon Valley. Trump is actually unlearning them. Trump is going after all the institutions that actually created growth in the U.S. for the last uh, hundred years, you know, the kind of organizations I talk about in my previous book. Um, and, and Denmark has been able actually to be kind of mission oriented, right? They understood green, for example, not just in terms of manufacturing, but they really had a green city strategy in Copenhagen. They produced not only great manufacturing companies like Vesta's, in the green sector, but all the different services, dynamic digital services that were necessary for that. And, you know, along the way, they become the number one provider of these, you know, really um, ambitious new types of services to China. 
And when I use the word mission, I actually just wrote a report for the European Commission on missions, and the, the concept of missions have act, has actually now become law in the European Commission for its new Horizon program, which is 100 billion uh, euros that's going to be spent on challenge-led uh, investments. But, you know, going to the moon was a mission that required lots of different sectors to interact and lots of different projects to get there. And most of those projects actually failed, but the ones that succeeded, again, are, you know, in our smart products today. But that willingness to experiment, the bottom-up experimentation, but fixed on a goal, a social goal, I really believe that that mission-oriented kind of notion also of what politics and policies are for can re-engage people and can actually help us to battle against this sense, which is a real sense in people's imagination, that politics doesn't matter, that it's, you know, there's lots of corruption, that actually in the end, again, their real wages aren't going up. If we can really um, focus these co-investments across society and public, private, third sector institutions to solve problems that matter, you know, whether it be big global issues, so the SDGs, transforming them into the sustainable development goals, into mm -hmm. concrete missions, like getting the plastic out of the oceans, that's a great mission. But also within countries, there's all sorts of interesting missions around clean cities or issues around the aging problems that the aging population are facing, but that different types of investments across uh, society would be required. And we have a report actually coming out in two weeks, which is going to be arguing that what we need in the health area, and this is huge, right? There's huge debates across many different countries of what to do with this problem of cost of medicine spiraling out of control and also healthcare systems being really in crisis. How to use a mission-oriented approach to rethink how we even think about our health innovation system to better align these activities that we know are very important in the real economy around innovation, but also then the access to those innovations. So we have not just innovation-led growth, but inclusive growth. Currently, the health area is one of the most uh, stark examples of what I'm talking about. Huge amounts of public investments in an area that is essential for people's livelihood, which then gets captured in value extraction activities. So you have, uh, you know, either Martin Shkreli, who increased the prices of particular uh, drugs by over a thousand percent, or last night uh, that 400 percent increase in antibiotics. That's just as bad as what happened in the banks. Well, th uh, this was a very valuable conversation for us, I know. And I, I'd love to talk to you all night long, but you got to catch a flight. So I'm going to let you go now, okay? Okay, thank you very much. That is Professor Mariano Mazzucato, The Value of Everything, Making and Taking in the Global Economy. Auguri on the book, and uh, ci vediamo alla prossima volta, signore. Grazie molto, arrivederci. Ciao. Ciao. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.